Hello, art appreciation students. I'm your professor, Lacey Miller. Hopefully you watched the little video in the start here section, which kind of gave an overview of the course. So this is the first video recorded study guide for you guys to follow along with. And just so you know, it's a little bit more thorough than some of the others, because I know that it's the beginning of the semester and some of you may have just added the class as part of the drop ad or you're waiting for your book to arrive from Amazon and I want to make sure that everybody gets off on the right start for the semester. So there's these little yellow quiz prep um, icons that I've put throughout this little lecture and that lets you know that there is very likely some information um, a quiz question is almost certainly going to correspond with the information there. And a few of the quiz questions are actually in this lecture. So let's go ahead and get started. So before we actually dive into uh, this chapter one's course material, I wanted to kind of pose a question and talk to you guys about why you would want to study art and art appreciation. So I'm going to go under the assumption that most of you are taking this class as part of your general electives, but I want you to know that art is a visual language and it can communicate as much if not more than any written or verbal language. We've all heard that sort of colloquial phrase that a picture is worth a thousand words. So studying art is going to help you learn to see new horizons, which sounds very, um, it's a very kind of flowery language there. But basically what that, that means is it's gonna give you empathy, empathy towards um, other situations that may not be the same as your situation. It's gonna allow you to put yourself in the shoes of others. And on top of that, another thing that's really good about studying art, and one of the reasons why you should really pay attention in this class, is the vocabulary that you're going to learn in this class is going to translate and overlap with all the other disciplines. So again, it's a visual language. So the language that we use to talk about that is the language of seeing. And that's going to be a big part of your uh, career and whatever you choose to study, whether it's in the humanities or the sciences. So let's proceed. This is chapter one, Living with Art. We're going to talk about the impulse for art, what artists do, and then creating and creativity. So no human society in history has ever lived without some form of art every group to develop into a society, every um, tribe that's ever been, anything like that, has always had art in some form of another. And the ability to make art, to make images, is uniquely human. So you may have seen like a YouTube video or something of an elephant painting with their trunk or like a, there's one of like dogs that run through various colors of paint and then run around on a big canvas. That's, that's not the same thing. Um, that's not, th there's no intention of communication behind that. So it's, a, it's, not, it's not the same, even though it may look the same, and it's entertaining nonetheless. But the ability to make images is uniquely human. And let's start at the beginning of when humans started making art. Okay, so this is one of the earliest artworks that man has created. So this is a section of the lion panel in the Chateauvet cave in France. This is figure 1.3 in your book, right? So we're only looking at a section of this. This is a cave painting that goes all the way around the, um, the interior walls of this cave, um, usually at about sort of human arm height, right? It's made with local found materials to so the area, so soot, um, maybe some minerals that would be scratched into the stone, um, animal fats, oils, um, any other kind of, um, anything that would leave a mark on the wall would be used and was local. So what are we looking at here? We've got sort of a group of predator animals over on this side, lions, and then 
sort of prey food source animals over on this side, mainly rhinos. And these are local animals to the area for the time. Uh, Paleolithic man would have had a lot of interest in both of these types of animals because they would be potential prey to the one group and then the other group would be part of their food source, right? So both these groups of animals that interact obviously with each other in this image would also be interacting with Paleolithic man. So it's not, um, it's not like these are fantasy creatures that they sort of thought of. These are the creatures that they see and deal with in their everyday lives. All right, so quiz prep question, right? So I put this image in, which is a slightly different vantage point for this. So this is the same, um, the same panel, the same section of the lion panel, but here we can kind of see the ground and I can kind of see a little bit more of the cave. It gives you a little bit more of the context of how this image would be seen by those who created it and then also by those who would um, have come back to this cave maybe generation after generation and what they would see. And I think it's telling when you kind of look at it, it looks like it's, it's moving like you could read it physically. And I think that contributes to the answer here. So the book... Um, says that our ability to learn a language is part of what our response for making arts. The correct answer is learn a language, but I just wanted to make sure that we're all clear because this question is kind of tricky. All of these things, reproduction, food sources, food gathering, seeking shelter, seeking safety, are all things that would be very, very important to Paleolithic man and all things that he would have made artwork about. So like I said before, this one is sort of about food sources and also maybe the prey predator relationship of humans and lions at the time. So that sort of falls under seeking shelter and gathering food. So don't let that confuse you. The book wants you to wants the answer to be learn a language. I wish they would have worded that differently. I wish they would have said something like mm, communicate something to someone who's not there or something of that nature. Learn a language I think boxes the idea in a little too much but just want you guys to get the right answer. All right another quiz question here about radiocarbon dating and um, when specifically this image, the lion panel, would have been made, which is one of the earliest images that we have. So I've said the answer a couple times, um, and I think you guys can get the right answer. So the next thing that we're going to talk about is the slightly moving forward in time. During the Paleolithic period, when the lion panel would have been created, this work up here, um, man was very much so in a hunter-gatherer state. They followed herds of animals as they migrated with the seasons, right? So they followed their food sources. Their lifestyle was very food source driven. And then when we move into the Neolithic era, which is when people really started settling down, agriculture was becoming much more uh, much more involved. People were living in one stable place for all the whole year. Now, this isn't to say that nobody lived in one place during the Paleolithic era and everybody stopped being hunter-gatherers during the Neolithic era. It's not that clean cut of a distinction, but it is a major shift in the way people live. So during the Neolithic era, um, things like monuments were starting to be built, permanent structures. So here is a uh, quiz question that you will probably encounter, and it's about a quotation. So all art is basically Paleolithic or Neolithic, either the urge to smudge soot and grease on cave walls or pile stone on stone. So this was stated by Anthony Caro. He is a uh, sculptor from the... 1950s around that time frame. So again, I'm only telling you the correct answer to this because some of you may or may not have your books. All right, 
According to the author, the impulse to create art comes from our basic human interest in. So we're going to kind of dive into this question here. So this is a list of what artists do. So artists in all societies create art for similar reasons. Um, art looks very different across the whole spectrum of the world, which is part of what we're going to learn about in this class. But there are these sort of six or eight or a little bit more sort of core things that artists are trying to undertake, that they're trying to do whenever they make a work of art. And we're just going to look at a couple of these in um in a little bit more detail first we're going to look at number two which is to create extraordinary visions of ordinary objects so this is also in your book this is figure 1.2 this is constantine brancouche's work bird in space right so this is an extraordinary vision of an ordinary object right this is like a bird in space so we would think in flight right at least when i look at this work i think of a bird sort of in flight and that swoop that they kind of make right so this is a timeless thing that people would see as birds um in space right and we can assume that they would see it for much into the future right so there's this timeless quality to it there's this simple quality to it and there's also this sort of um pure right it's stripped of everything we don't know what kind of bird this is there's no sort of details that would lead us to believe that this is one type of bird versus another a large bird a small bird right but we have sort of the essence of a bird in space right so it's giving that extraordinary vision to something that we see all the time and that people see all over the world all the time there is a uh, quiz question about this right so the was searching for what I told you in the last slide so you can go back and review if need be all right so the next thing that artists do oftentimes is give tangible form to feelings and ideas feeling and ideas are not physical things and sometimes it's difficult to come up with the right words or the right um, way of expressing a feeling or idea that you have and one of the best artists to do this is vincent van gogh so this is his work starry night which you probably have um, seen before there may or may not be a test question about this work but you have probably seen this uh, even if this is your first art class but to talk more about vincent van gogh's ability to make tangible images of his feelings and emotions we're going to talk about him as a person so this is a um, image that's not in your book but i think it better helps depict vincent van gogh than starry night does so this is self-portrait with a bandaged ear so we know that vincent van gogh suffered with mental illness for the entirety of his life and he was a very very avid um, letter writer and wrote about his art and about his emotions and feelings um, the major person he wrote to in his life was his brother theo van gogh who um, at the time when Vincent Van Price passed away, Theo Van Gogh was the one who, um, who inherited all of his artworks. So let's talk about this moment in Vincent Van Gogh's life, the self-portrait with the bandaged ear. So we see him here and he's just sitting. We see his paintings behind him, right? You can see a little bit of his easel and whatnot, but he's looking at you turned away from the artwork and he has this bandaged ear. So Vincent van Gogh lived with another artist called Paul Gauguin and they were friends um, and they were both fellow artists working at the same time. And Vincent van Gogh was very excited about this arrangement that he was going to get to live with another artist and paint and work. And it was going to be this, he had the assumption that it was going to be this great time in his life. <clears throat> but um, like I said, he suffered with mental illness for the entirety of his life so 
Him and Paul Gauguin got into a large argument. And Gauguin said, I do not want to be your friend anymore. I do not want to live with you. I do not want to talk about art anymore. I, you know, I, our friendship is over. And Vincent van Gogh was so hurt by this moment. And he thought to himself, there has to be something that I can do to prevent this from ever happening again. I have to remember this moment for the rest of my life. I have to remember what I said and what I did to drive my friend away. So he cut off his own ear, right? Very extreme response. But again, he suffered with mental illness, right? So we know this story. We know he, we have documentation of how he was feeling and what he was going through at that time because he told um, his friends and family, specifically his brother Theo, in letters. And then we also see this portrait that he painted. So even though this portrait is simply like a snapshot of the moment in his life, when you really look at it and you see how he's turned away from his artwork, how he's looking at the viewer, he sort of has this bandaged ear, but yet at the same time, he's trying to hide it a little bit with this hat, right? So there's this slight, we can feel his shame a little bit. We can also see his sadness and we can see how he sort of lost interest in the things that he loves behind him because of this event in his life. Now, so all of those things we're able to give verbal words to, but I think this portrait gives that tangible feeling to that. The blues of it and whatnot give that feeling more than the words, the, the words of telling the story. All right, so here are one of those things in the book that I'm, it's not that I don't agree with. So creative people and artists tend to have these personality traits, but I, I dislike when books um, say that persons, people of specific jobs or specific careers tend to have said personality traits. I feel like it boxes people in and boxes people out. So yes, it is true that artists sometimes have heightened sensitivity or um, heightened fluency where they can have the free flow of ideas. But engineers can have those same personality traits. And not every artist is organized or flexible. It's there's quiz questions about this and I want to bring it up, but I also want to bring it up and say, like, don't take it with a grain of salt. All right. So the next vocabulary word that I want you guys to be aware of is aesthetics. So you're going to hear this word a lot in this class. And aesthetics is a branch of philosophy and it deals with our likes and dislikes um, of sensory experiences. So it's not just about art and what we see. It's also about our response to what we hear, what we taste, what we touch and smell. All of our senses are involved in the idea of aesthetics. If you've heard this term before, you may have likely heard it in the context of like a home makeover kind of show or something of that nature. We've all heard the country kitchen aesthetic or the modern aesthetic of furniture, right? It's used in that context a lot more, but it really encompasses everything that you like, that you don't like, and your response to that. It's what is art and why we like the art that we like and the responses that we have to art, whether they be positive or negative, whether they be sort of cringeworthy, or you feel massive amounts of empathy for someone, all of that is issues of aesthetics. So it's a very large umbrella term. All right, so next we're gonna talk about two artworks that were made um, almost a century apart that deal with some of the same things. So during the 1600s in um, Holland, so Dutch artists, one of the really popular things to do was make these artworks called vanitas. All right, this comes from the Latin word for vanity. And what these are about is they're about the things that you like in the world, the earthly things that you like, 
right? So this artist has made one, a common theme in all of these venitas is skulls, right? So we're thinking about the fleeting nature of the things that you love in this world because we're all going to pass, right? So we, so skulls are a common theme and we see that in both of these artworks, right? So there's that fleeting nature and then there's all the things that we like. So this person obviously loves sort of literature and books, storytelling. We also have some money and some gold coins and what looks like some jewelry. We have art in the background. We have this painting here, right? That kind of makes sense that this is an artist who's painting these. We have this sort of globe thing here referring to maybe art and science. There isn't a lot of distinction during the Renaissance period between being an artist, being a scientist, they're kind of the same thing at the time, or at least they overlap significantly. So that's what this earlier Venita is about. And then if we go here into the future in the um, 1970s with Audrey Flack's um, Venita, which is called Wheel of Fortune, we see there's like this element of consumerism, right? So we still have that same sort of passage of time and the fleeting nature of things and she kind of expresses that a with the skull and then also with this um stand through the hourglass the hourglass here so we have this tarot card right trying to think about predicting the future seeing the future what can you have and gain in your earthly life and earthly happiness and then we also see elements of consumerism and vanity Right, so this comes from the Latin word vanity. So we see this lipstick here, we see two different mirrors both reflecting, we see sort of these grapes up here. So there's this sort of fleeting nature of beauty and maybe consumerism that is trying to keep that beauty on your side, right? We see this beautiful girl in a frame up here. Right. So that's just some of the things that we're thinking about this artwork. And it's interesting to note how Audrey Flack is looking back to previous artworks to inform what she's trying to say in her artwork. All right. So I'm going to ask you guys this question, and I put it in a quote from the text. So that way you'll know the answer. But we're going to explore this idea a little bit as we go forward. So according to the author, the most important meaning of an artwork is, right? and you can get the, the correct answer from the slide. Okay, so keeping in mind the last, the question from the last slide, I want to talk about Mike Kelly's work. This is Candor's full set. It's made of cast resin, blown glass, and illuminated pedestals. I want you to take a moment and make a judgment about it. Do you like it? Would you want to see it? Do you want to know more? What do you think is going on? Right? And now I'm going to explain it to you. So it's kind of an interesting backstory. So Mike Kelly was interested in how we have this idea of nostalgia about our childhoods. Right? So our childhoods always have this kind of rosy. We, we look back at our childhood with rose-colored glasses. And he read a Superman comic. And apparently in the storyline of Superman, which I was not familiar with until I became more acquainted with Mike Kelly's work, is that Superman keeps his hometown. He's just to let you know, he's from another planet. And he keeps his hometown in a bell jar in his fortress of solitude. Right? This is part of the storyline. So not only is he keeping this sort of mental, um, in, you know, nostalgic view of his childhood and his childhood home, he's actually physically keeping it preserved in this bell jar. So I want to ask another question about this. So as Kelly was doing this research, he noticed that Superman, the comic book, has been around for a very, very long time, and many, many different artists have contributed to it. So he found it really interesting that no two artists ever depicted this city inside of the bell jar or this city inside of this bottle um, the same way. They always 
all look different. So even though Superman kind of has a similar look, right, with his like Clark Kent glasses and whatnot, he looks similar even though different artists are depicting him. But this one little element always looked vastly different. So that's what he recreated for this artwork, was all those different experiences and different visions, different artist visions of this city in a bottle. So now I want to ask you, since you're the main person, according to the author, of what the artwork is, uh, is about, is your opinion, right, from that question just a minute ago, is could you appreciate this artwork without knowing that? Do you appreciate it more now that you have a little bit more information about it? All right. So this is going to bring us to our next idea. And that is that you should be aware of the process of looking. Right. That is one of the keys to looking at art and one of the things that we are going to continuously do throughout this class is try to better understand why art means different things to different people. If you looked at Mike Kelly's work for the first time um, and didn't know anything about Superman and didn't like Superman, you might have a different response to it than someone who grew up with the comic and remembered that and had this sort of affection and appreciation for it. Right? So different people are responding to that art in different ways. And that information right, that I presented to you about the artwork may or may not have changed your thinking of it or your opinion of it. But the fact is that you should be aware of that process. We have this thing in our lives called selective perception, and it's filtering information. This is the definition, filtering information that allows us to focus on immediate tasks at hand. And we use this when we look at art. But selective perception means a couple more things. It means that we're consciously or unconsciously not paying attention to certain elements. And the reason that we may or may not be paying attention to them is because they may provoke emotional discomfort or they may contradict our previous biases. If you've ever heard this term selective perception, more than likely you've heard it in a psychology class or maybe in a sociology class, right? Selective perception is very important. Um, this ability that we as human beings have to filter information is wonderful. Basically, it means that when you're looking at a problem, you can say, these things are not part of the problem. I do not need to worry with them or be concerned with them because I have this thing to worry about. So it's a great tool, but it can also be a, a crutch or a hindrance to our fully understanding artwork. Right, the most famous um, selective perception test is sort of this one here. Right. Is this an old woman or a young woman? You may or may not have seen that before. It is both. It's sort of like, which one do you see first? Which one do you see most of the time when you look at it? Right. So that's about selective perception. So. All right. This is our last slide. These are some of the key terms that we've talked about today and some of the key topics. If you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to email me. Good luck on your test, and please don't forget about this week's discussion board. It's the first week, so it's about introducing yourself. It should be one of the easiest of all the discussion boards. So thank you, and have a good day, guys.